When The Witcher 3 came out in 2015, most people wouldn't have predicted exactly how alone this game would stand as the type of thing it is. It's such a deep, sprawling narrative that branches out in so many different ways, allowing you to explore a world that seems fully alive, not just in foliage or visual detail, but everything everyone has to say feels grounded in something. It's more alive than other games like this typically are, still in 2020. But what exactly is the appeal? Why is this game so big? Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks we ask the question, why was Witcher 3 Wild Hunt a big deal? So the first thing I want to hit right off is when you turn on this game in 2020, it's still impressive to look at. Yes, a lot of games from 2015 held up, but I think The Witcher 3 holds up in a specific way. It is a beautiful medieval game that renders nature in such a honest and simple way. A lot more overgrowth and the like on display than a lot of other similar games, especially from that time period. Like Batman Arkham Knight is a beautiful game, but it doesn't need to render foliage. You could really say that with a lot of games from that year, Bloodborne, The Phantom Pain. Yeah, they're really nice looking, but I would say that Witcher 3 is almost the biggest step in rendering nature since Skyrim. Fallout 4 came out the same year and is nowhere nearly as pretty as this game, and I think is an actual more accurate comparison to this game, despite its totally different premise and setting. But that's just what's immediately noticeable. If you play the game for any period of time, you end up finding that this is well beyond just graphically a pretty game. The main thrust of the story is that Geralt of Rivia, a witcher, someone who hunts monsters, is looking to save his adoptive daughter, who the Wild Hunt is after. Who's the Wild Hunt? They're a group of wraiths and specters galloping through the dimensional fabric of the world, looking to find and capture slaves to serve the Alder Folk. Your adoptive daughter's name is Ciri, and obviously people are attached to their families, so the point is to rescue her from them. But that sounds like a very simple story, and this is anything but. Besides being Geralt's adoptive daughter, Ciri is also the real daughter of Emir Var Emrys, the Emperor, who is waging a war to expand that empire. It ends up branching out from there, telling us a story that's half fantasy, half historical allegory for religiously motivated genocide, as well as a vehicle for some incredibly personal stories like the Bloody Baron and his abusive past with his family, who had left him alone, wallowing in his misery. This questline perhaps best encompasses why The Witcher 3 is so good. It so perfectly intertwines narrative goals, gameplay goals, and a branching storyline that tells us more about the world and the people living in it that you just can't learn from being a kick-ass superhuman monster hunter who's roaming the countryside and killing beasts. The Baron's story goes in so many different directions, from his unborn child that you have to perform a magical ritual on that ultimately it lands in the player's hands whether or not the Baron gets redemption. Ultimately, you could save people, technically make everything right, and still the Baron might hang himself. No one in the story has a moral clarity over the situation, including you. As the player, not only is the combat part of the gameplay, but so is the choice, and the choice presented in this scenario actually feels incredibly meaningful. There's a few different endings for this story, but honestly, it can feel like a game unto itself. But there's so much more to it. That's a story about individuals, but there's so many stories of this kind of depth that it creates a totality of a narrative lore that you just don't find in a lot of games, including games that are good. It's important to note that Witcher 3's depth and detail in its narrative, as well as its intertwining of the narrative with the gameplay, is exceptional to the point where this game did incredibly well, but there are so few copycats of it. The reason for that is the quality. You could copy the structure, but how are you going to make a game that fills the needs that this game fills? narratively or even gameplay speaking. Just aping the structure of it, making a quote-unquote clone, 
without polished gameplay and a damn good narrative, it's just gonna ring hollow, and that's why people didn't really try to do it. But I could also spend tons of time telling you how enjoyable the combat itself is. Yes, it can get repetitive, it isn't the most expansive combat that's ever been created for a video game, but it also fits into the context of this game so perfectly. It's not quite a hack and slash, it's not not a hack and slash though. There's more than a fair amount to do with the combat, there's a lot of customizable moves, magic, and requirements for certain types of battles. Is your enemy invisible? Well, you're going to have to cast a spell that when they walk inside a designated area, they will be at least partially visible. Maybe they're only vulnerable when they're visible, making it imperative to even fight the battle. The adrenaline points incentivize you continuing to battle and not back off to make quick choices. As if you back off and slow down, it will begin to decrease and your effectiveness will go down. You can equip skills, one of my favorites is the Undying skill, for instance, which utilizes adrenaline points in case you run out of health. When your health reaches zero, adrenaline will be consumed, restoring your health. There are much more advanced skills in the game, but I can't tell you how many times I have relied on that particular one throughout the entire game. It's not the most extensive list of skills that have ever existed in a video game. However, when combined with the six signs or spells, there's a large number of possibilities and replay value, and I find that even when I go into the game now, I'm excited and interested by the combat, and not a lot of games are like that today. Witcher 3 also went way beyond what was necessary for its DLC, giving us two different expansions, I would say both of which qualify as an entire new game's worth of content. Hearts of Stone, the first DLC being around 10 hours, and Blood and Wine, the second, taking place in an entirely different place and being over 20 hours long, as well as functioning kind of as a satire of high fantasy. Not all the time, but for a lot of the time. Blood and Wine also brought in a mutation system which allowed you to branch out even further in what was possible for Geralt to do. And if you've been listening, the thing I've emphasized probably in every one of these things is player choice. You can choose what clothes Geralt is wearing, you can change how he reacts to things, you can choose where to go, you can choose who to believe, you can choose a fighting style that makes more sense for you. I actually kept it pretty simple throughout the whole game. Once you get the rhythm and plot out a strategy in your mind, you can choose to hone those skills or build new skills. You can choose to play Gwent, the in-world card game, way more than you need to. In fact, you can choose to go to playgwent.com and download a standalone Gwent, which, by the way, is actually a ton of fun. I play it on my PC, where I never thought I would be playing any card game. What we're talking about is a video game that embodies everything that somebody from maybe the 1990s who loved narrative point and click games as much as they loved hack and slash games, but through the years has developed a taste for political intrigue as well. But most importantly, given that you can choose how you interact with this world in so many different ways, if there weren't any real stakes, if the world itself wasn't that believable, that choice wouldn't really matter. This game manages to make the stakes incredibly personal, as well as deliver a world to you that doesn't feel like you have to be there for it to exist. A lot of open world games, while well, expansive and beautiful and incredibly artfully made, sometimes feel a bit like a theme park that you just have the ability to go do whatever in. Witcher 3 feels like a world. It feels like if Geralt disappeared, well, it wouldn't be that different. Geralt isn't this one man who can save us all. He's just one man. Yeah, he does have superpowers, and yeah, he does fight big threats to save people, but he does it as a job. He makes money for it. Man, other people do that. If he wasn't there, those other people would probably pick up the slack. Everything in this game lands. And that almost never happens when games are this big. And for me, that's it. That's why it's such a big deal. It's everything that the open world game has ever promised us. And it's one of just a handful of games that has ever done that. What do you think, though? What really landed for you about Witcher 3? Are you excited for more work from CD Projekt Red? This is the year Cyberpunk is hitting. 
And with the amount of time they put into it, it better be similar in scope. Leave us a comment, let us know what you think. If you like this video, click the like button. And if you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week and the best way to see them first is of course a subscription. So click subscribe and don't forget to enable all notifications. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon, you can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.